Hello, I'm Craig Rotzler, Senior Conference Manager with CenterWatch, and welcome to today's webinar on bringing ClinOps technology to the clinical site, stories from the front lines. This webinar is brought to you by Agatha. We're expecting this session to last about 45 minutes, followed by a live question and answer session. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Please, please feel free to prepare your questions for our presenters. We encourage you to ask questions at any time during the presentation. And questions will not be, well, sorry, questions will be addressed at the end. And to ask a question, you can simply type your question in the area provided and press enter. And questions will not be viewable to other attendees. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker and moderator today is Ken Lowney. He is the head of North American Operations for Agatha Life Sciences, a provider of SaaS-based business applications for managing SOP, regulatory documents, and e-clinical trial master file records. His goal is to help organize Organizations implement easy to deploy solutions that empower businesses, users to focus on their work, not the technology. And Ken is a graduate of Colgate University and the Sloan School of Management at MIT, and is a frequent speaker at industry conferences. So Ken, great to have you here with us today. I'll go ahead and uh, pass it on over to you. All righty then. Thank you so much, Craig. I really appreciate it. Welcome to everybody who's joined. I'm sitting in middle of New Hampshire State, over by the Vermont line. A little overcast, but a pretty fall day. One benefit is I get to stay in a hotel, not stay, but use it for the day. Uh, and I haven't, like you, left my house in a long time. But I need to use a, a hotel room for my conferences because it's better bandwidth. So I get a, a free lunch out of the deal. I hope you get a free lunch out of the deal, too. As Craig said, my name is Ken Lowney. Uh, I won't go through any more of an introduction. Uh, my role at Agatha is the head of the U.S. business, and Agatha is a software vendor. And that's going to mm, be important to you to understand as we go through this conversation. I'm really excited about our topic today. It's never a good practice to read a slide. But in this case, this uh, very brief summary, I think, is worth it. It's a pretty cogent description of what I'm trying to accomplish with Jill today. Here we go. Sponsors and CROs have invested millions, perhaps even billions, on automating ClinOps processes over the last 30 years, beginning in the 90s. But the linchpin of every study is actually the clinical site. That's where patients are seen and treated. That's where the data originates. So I want to see why those sites are such laggards with the adoption of automation. I want to see what we can learn about the path to automation in clinical sites from an expert and one who has navigated that path herself. And as I said, that's Jill, who I'll be introducing in a very complete way in a minute. For now, I'll just let you know Jill Hines will be joining me in about five minutes, and I'll uh, give you the complete introduction at that time. To set the stage, I just want to make three points, just three. The first is that clinical studies are expensive. This isn't rocket science, and it's only one slide. But I just want to remind you of how expensive they are and why so much technology has been pointed at clinical operations. And that's because, use the redundant slide, um, this goes back just a couple of years. And the average median estimated cost of a clinical trial was $19 million. They go as high as $345 million. So the, the cluster is between 12 and 33 million, but they're very expensive to do, and there's been a lot of technology focused on clinical trials because of the expense. Craig, I'll just note my slides are moving forward of their own accord. Perhaps somebody else is clicking. Yeah, just to remind other uh, presenters and panelists not to click on the slides, please. Okay, thank you. The second point I want to make is that, remember I said there would only be three, IT initiatives often fail. Although my uh, life's work has been in software and much of it in life sciences, it has been with bigger companies. And the, the biggest challenge is the failure rate on large IT initiatives and investments is really remarkable. For many years, more than 20 years, an organization called the Standish Organization has issued the Standish Chaos Report. And the Chaos Report documents success and failure of IT initiatives. This is from the 2020 Standish Report. And you can see the numbers yourself. Out of the total N, the population that they surveyed, 
only 16% of projects were deemed successful. That is completed on time and budget with the functionality desired. The majority, 53%, were over cost or over time or lacking what was promised. And a full 31% were classified as failed. So these are big numbers. Lots of people challenge the Standish Report and the definition of success, et cetera. And I don't want to have that discussion. I don't believe those numbers exactly as they are. But the point is still valid that the investments in IT often don't pay off as they're expected to. And then you can get into reasons why and why not. This slide is coming also from the Standish Report's data. And you may not know these two words, agile and waterfall. But what I'll give you as life sciences clean ops people is agile is a methodology for implementing systems. And it means working with smaller chunks and smaller pieces of time in an iterative model. It means many other things than that, but let's leave it at that. And one of the lessons is big bang waterfall projects where you try to define everything up front and then turn the key and implement a big bang system all at once, a very high failure rate and very low success rate. The agile model improves it dramatically. So one takeaway is smaller chunks, smaller timelines for each chunk, and iterate to build on your success rather than think you know all the answers up front. If you look at the causes of project failure in the IT space, one of the things that's remarkable is on these five items, I'll just read them, the missing focus, not focus on the right thing, content issues, meaning the information wasn't available for the system, um, execution issues, of course, unexplained issues, but also staff issues, training issues, and change management. You know what's really interesting? None of these are technology issues. The causes of failed projects overwhelmingly are organizational and behavioral. And I'm just laying that out there. Remember, I said I'd say three things before we make it a wider conversation. One is that clinical studies are expensive, and the second is that all IT projects suffer from a high failure rate. And I want to think about that as we think about clinical studies. One thing that I wanted to make sure I teed up for our conversation later is simply the term site burden, the idea that Clinical sites often find themselves as the tail of the dog being wagged. They end up with a burden to do more paperwork, to take more time, staff time, to invest more money, to complete the clinical study that was designed by a sponsor and CRO. And site burden is a really good term because it creates the image, as I have on the screen, of the site carrying a lot of the load, but without uh, the similar budgets and tools. Third item, last item. Clinical sites are the missing pieces in the puzzle. So studies are expensive. IT initiatives fail a lot. But clinical sites are essential to getting the value out of automation. And why is that? We all know this ecosystem. We have sponsors, CROs delivering services and other service organizations. And we have sites. Of course, we have the health authorities at the top. These are the main bodies of the players. There might be many service organizations. There may be many, many sites across many countries. But that is the ecosystem. And what we know is we've invested lots of technology dollars with sponsors and CROs. As a vendor myself, sponsors and CROs are my target. That's who I work with. Because sites are underfunded, sites are smaller, if they're hospitals, they may have money, but they're very bureaucratic and hard to make change in. So under automation at the site really affects the whole ecosystem because you lose the flow from the site to the CRO to the sponsor back to the site. You get interrupted if the site isn't automated and everything goes back to paper copying, should I say faxing? Um, different ways of communicating information that kind of affect the whole system uh, that's trying to improve automation. I know Jill and I have talked about this, it'll probably come up again, that everything goes back to paper at the site if the site's not automated. 
So those are the three things I wanted to bring up before bringing Jill in. And now I do want to bring Jill in. So Jill is the president, um, the, the chief operating person, if you will, at two clinical sites, injury care research and family care research. Um, I, I have a lot to talk about with uh, Jill. What I want you to know is that she's uh, very accomplished. She has um, built these organizations into what they are today, and they are fully automated. And that's why we've asked Jill to join us today, to help illuminate the path uh, from when she started to where she is now, what she learned along the way, and what she has to share with others. So let's get into that. You'll see me looking aside to my notes, Jill. I'm not a professional journalist, so I apologize. Um, I wanted to start with setting the table for you of two questions. You can put them together into essay format as you choose. How, how did you start and what was your journey to the point that you have these two clinical uh, site organizations? And then tell me a little bit about those sites, those organizations, injury care and family, uh, injury research, excuse me, and family care. I'm really interested in those businesses uh, as they exist today. Go ahead. Sure. So first off, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, it's a 20 year journey that started right out of uh, my undergraduate um, program. I had thought I'd wanted to go be a doctor, kind of changed courses. And while I was deciding what I really wanted to be when I grew up, I worked for a local cancer hospital uh, here in Boise, Idaho, and got in their research department. Um, I had a biology and chemistry degree, so it kind of somewhat matched my program and started working with government grants sponsored by the National Cancer Institute on some cancer screening studies. We also, for anybody that's uh, in the cancer research world, we worked on SWOG and COG, um, Children's Oncology Group and Southwest Oncology Group uh, studies. And I kind of got the research bug um, from various avenues and decided that's where I, I needed to kind of stick. So that hospital was gracious enough to send me to graduate school. And after that, I ended up working for what's called a site management organization. Companies similar to what I have, and they did great research. I learned a lot. We worked with multiple different physicians and in different scenarios. Uh, but they suffered, while well, they did great research, they suffered some from, from some uh, cash flow issues. And so at the time, I had known a lot of different physicians in my area and decided, well, I'm going to go try this on my own. And so started injury care research with a PI that's still a PI today. That was 10 years ago. And him and I started doing, he's a chronic pain physician. So that's where injury care research was born 10 years ago. Then um, a couple of years ago, we decided um, just my staff and I, and I, I had started working with a glaucoma surgeon and we'd started working with a neurologist and some other physicians in the area and realized injury care research didn't really match what we were doing um, in those other clinics. So I formed Family Care Research as a, a separate company to um, accommodate other clinics and other physicians that we're working with now. So that's how both companies were formed. And as I kind of alluded to, injury care research mainly does chronic pain research studies from osteoarthritis, neuralgias, um, you name it. And the other family care research does just about anything else from glaucoma to neurology to family practice um, type research studies. And now we're working in the COVID world um, as a lot of clinics and, and research sites have started. I'm always embarrassed right at this point. It's happened with me and you before in that I'm a classic East Coast person and therefore I know about California, but not much in between. And <laughs> I'm always embarrassed. Is it Iowa or Idaho? I apologize. We get that a lot, a lot. It's Idaho. So Boise, Idaho, oh. we're right. We border Oregon and Washington over in the Northwest. Sorry about that. It's very embarrassing. <laughs> I married an East Coaster, so I get it. Don't he gives me all that hard time too. My uh, my kids always were better at geography than I was. Um, I'm trying to get a sense of the size, and the best way I think I can ask it is between the two sites. About how many studies are active at any time? Uh, we're we're considered small, very small, in fact. Um, 
it, between the two sites, we're lucky if we get 20 studies. Um, so 10, anywhere from 10 on a slow, well, we haven't had just 10 for a while. So I'd say 15 to 20 enrolling studies, um, enrolling and in maintenance. I don't know why you caveated that with small, because that seems like a very busy place to me. Um, well, it is busy. Knowing how, uh, how much each study takes in terms of uh, administrivia, et cetera. So the reason we're talking today is on this topic of site automation um, and bringing ClinOps technology onto sites. And again, you have proven the ability to do it with your two locations. And I wanted to sort something out for people listening in. And even I get stumbled with the uh, acronyms in our industry. So can you go through the ABCs of the systems you have in place, you know, a CTMS, a, a e-source, e et cetera. Just take me through them. Yeah, we do. We started with CTMS, uh, then we added on e-regulatory, then e-source, and recently because of COVID, e-consent. So I want to break those down just for a second. And because of the tendency for nomenclature to be so domain specific, sites versus CROs versus sponsors. And since I don't know who's on the phone, I wanna make sure we all have the same language. The one I'm most confident of is CTMS, the Clinical Trial Management System. And uh, the, the common understanding is this is the project management piece uh, for managing the schedule, managing the budget, managing um, the details of the entire uh, clinical trial. Is that a reasonable description for you? I would say so. Okay, so that doesn't change much between you and the sponsor side. E-source um, for you means a place, electronic for the E, to put source documents. And source documents for you uh, obviously are things like informed consent and other things. Is it also get into patient records or is that separate for you? Yes. So we, like I said, we have multiple locations between both companies where we go into different physicians' offices. And what we, most of them are in uh, electronic medical records and can fax into our system their records. And it can go directly from their system into ours. And that's how we import um, outside, we call them outside medical records for us because they are not part, well, they're part of our source, but they're not uh, documents we're creating. We're, we're getting those from the various physician offices we partner with. And then we have mm -hmm. eSource, which is the actual first place we record a patient's blood pressure or um, their height, their weight, any of any of the typical source document um, uh, data points that we need. My coordinators walk around either with a, with a laptop or a tablet, a tablet, and when they're talking with a patient, they're recording into that electronic uh, system. So can I use the term case report forms? And are, does that make sense in well, your world? Case report forms are kind of more on the sponsor side. Uh, so we sites have um, true source where we record data for the first time and then we put into either a database of some sort um, something that the sponsor has provided. So the source is, our, is ours. We, we have a software program that we have purchased at our site. That's the first place we record. And then the case report form um, is where that data then gets moved into it. And there's a couple different ways. We can just, back in the old days, we did carbon copy and we hand wrote it. Now we actually um, take it from our electronic system, split screen it, and we're entering it into their case report forms. We also have had a couple studies where there is direct data entry into their case report forms. That's coming. We don't see that very often. Uh, so there's a couple different ways. So case report form, I kind of will back up and say we might have a different definition. Uh, we do not consider case report forms to be sourced at our site. As an aside to the audience, this is my constant learning because although many years in this space, understanding the language and meaning of things in a site is one of the great things I've gotten from Jill is just in these conversations. No, that's really sponsor talk. Trial Master File is really sponsor talk. Yeah. Uh, CRF is really sponsor talk. So it's very useful for me to keep comparing the two and thinking about how one feeds the other or doesn't. Uh, E-consent, um, this has been a, another learning area for me, but we're talking about an electronic way to provide informed consent to sign off 
usually with an electronic pad or something like that, and capture the record. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. That That's exactly our definition as well. Okay. And the last one, I actually just don't know, so I apologize, E-Reg. So what's inside an E-Reg system? Well, so you use the term trial master file or ETMF if it's an electronic trial master file. So that's the sponsor side of an e-regulatory binder for us. Um, study sponsors have to keep the regulatory documents of 20, 30, 40, 100 different sites that they're you know, employing for this research. But the sites are required to keep their own regulatory documents. And so we don't call that the trial master file. We call that um, our e-regulatory binders, our um, ICSF, um, the, we have a couple different acronyms, but basically it's our version of the regulatory documents that we're required by law to keep at our site. So, um, and that's again at our site, completely electronic. I completely get that. I didn't know what I, I knew, which is, oh, of course, the investigator site file, the binder, the three ring bag. Yeah, absolutely. Just didn't know it was called EREG. So it's constantly like this. I hope this will be a very slightly humorous aside, but uh, I have a small farm and we raise pigs. And um, I'm sorry for some of you who this is hard to hear, but the pigs do become pork at some point. And um, what I've learned is nobody talks about the pieces of a pig the same way, that what you call a shoulder, someone else calls a rump, and what somebody else calls uh, country spare ribs are not ribs at all. It's really a confusing space. And that's kind of how I feel here. I have to learn the language of the site kind of a, a, a whole different way of speaking. So now let's talk about these four systems and your journey getting there. Was that a, all at once or was that over a, a full 10 year period? How did that kind of evolve for you? Well, when I started my company, CTMS programs were becoming more normal. Um, and that was 10 years ago. But when I started in clinical research, everything was paper. We didn't have, we had Excel spreadsheets, to do financials, we had paper source and we would actually, even the case report forms were in carbon copy and we would handwrite everything and everything would be fit. So I started my career completely paper. Um, 10 years ago, CTMS programs were getting to be pretty normal. Not every site was using them yet, but um, I've been an early adopter of technology most of my life. And so I knew when I started my company, I wanted to make sure the financials and that project management aspect of it was housed in one software program. So I started with CTMS. A few years later, I'd say about two or three, um, an e-regulatory vendor kind of came to me and I liked the idea because all small sites deal with space issues. We have a lot of storage that needs to happen. And when regulatory binders take up six two inch binders, that takes up a lot of shelf space they're not searchable. You lose the memos and the um, correspondence that you want to be able to search through. You, it's just cumbersome. And inevitably, those binders break and they're, it's just messy. So when that particular vendor came to me, I said, yes, sign me up. It'll save umpteen different shelves that now I can use for lab kits or paper charts because we were still on eSource. And so I, I, I signed on to eRegulatory. And then again, had e-regulatory and CTMS. And then a couple years later, an e-source vendor came to me and it was my last like little part that was still in paper was all that source documentation. And so then I implemented e-source. Uh, the problem was, is I had three different vendors, right? I had a CTMS pro vendor, I had an e-regulatory vendor, and then I had an e-source vendor. But I was fully electronic about that time. And that was about three and a half years ago now. Mm. We're going to come back to that three vendor question. You had said before that e-consent was the last thing that you implemented. And um, here's an interesting question, at least for me. That was your fourth. It was uh, it, it hit you right at point of sale, in probably the wrong term because you're not retail, but people had to change their behavior right on check-in and stuff. Was that, what did you do differently that you didn't do for the first system that made that go really well? What was one lesson learned you said, this time I'm gonna really do this really differently and the best it can possibly be with the consent? That's a great question actually, because I feel like we learn more from the things we screw up uh, mm -hmm. than if we did it right the first time. So I'd had experience 
pulling in technology and had made many, many errors during that, <laughs> pulling in those various technologies. So I, for this final third one, I, um, I always believe it's important to look at multiple different vendors that offer that service. So we interviewed three different e-consent vendors or uh, vendors that could provide electronic consent. Uh, we obviously compared pricing, whatnot. And then the most important part, because I think most people know to do that. Before we implemented it, we created policies as to who's going to manage it, what naming systems are we going to be um, using in it, any templates we were going to be putting in as automatic um, into that system before we, we stepped in, um, before we actually started that program. Um, in the past, I'd learned that lesson. I My colleagues will say I, I jumped first and learned to swim later. We would onboard a program, think we had a good idea of how it was going to work, and then months in go oh wait we're doing this wrong like we really should have done this and we should have had a policy for this and talked about whose job it was to so we're a little more careful at how we implement new technology um and i think for small sites like mine that's more the norm i don't think i'm outside of it we we think we know what we know um i think more established companies and people like you can who have been in technology know there's a lot of infrastructure that has to happen before you go live. Um, I learned that the hard way. I don't know. I think um, I'd have to reject the assumed compliment because I, I think people like yourself, deep into operations, who are talking about this is how we at our business answer the phone, this is how we greet a customer, mm -hmm. that choreograph things to that level, really, understand something or come to understand it. I was on a panel recently and this came up <clears throat> and I really got it, which is, you know, I, I, I work with lots of systems and I have lots of ideas about the best way to do it, but I am not the most detailed person. So here's another anecdote um, that hopefully will illuminate this point. Many of you have kids, many of you know teachers who are going through the move to remote or hybrid learning. And I have two teachers who are close in my family. And I was in a deep conversation about what the move to remote is like. And one of them told the story that made it so clear, which is, well, we had two weeks to get ready. We were deep into it. The policies came down from the superintendent. And then we had to figure out how will this quote really work? Mm -hmm. And they detected a flaw as they talked about each step. And one flaw was, what happens with second graders when you say, okay, go on and work on this for 15 minutes and then come back? Because second graders, if you say go somewhere for 15 minutes, they're gone, they're done, they don't know to come back. So believe it or not, at that level of detail, the school system realized we have to send egg timers to every kid. Set your egg timer now for 15 minutes and then come back when it dings. And that level of detail is what you're talking about, that you have to think about how this is actually gonna affect like you said, naming conventions, paper, where do we put this stuff? Where don't we do this? So I think that's a huge part of it. And then I think along with that, it's not an omission by you, but it's the training in those operations that nobody's unsure this is how it's going to work. And then that ties back to what I was saying about uh, an agile or sprint-based approach, which is, I don't know whether you did this, you can lie or, or not, but um, do it at one site first, get it working, iron out the bugs, and then blow it out to more. So the, the rollout process, all those things I think are huge on the change management side. Absolutely. We have a question. I'm, I just want JS to know, and I'm going to use initials for those of you who have questions. MJ and JS, I see both your questions, and we will get to them. I just want you to know that. So let's go back to multiple systems, multiple vendors. If you had to do it over again, would you be highly motivated to try to use one vendor? Or are you more of a best of breed person that the same vendor isn't that important? I'd rather have the best system. By the way, the, the analogy here is always, uh, do you, were you an album buyer or a singles buyer? You know, get the best songs you want, or yeah, this vendor has two good things and one crappy thing, but I'll take all three because it's one vendor. It's like the B side of, well, I just mixed my metaphor. But uh, the bad songs on an album. So, what do you right. think about that, Jill, for people listening? Well, I I did it that way just because that was what was available at the time. There wasn't vendors that had the total solution. Um, that didn't come till later. 
So I had to piecemeal it. I didn't really get that option. When you started 10 years ago, there wasn't an e-source vendor back in that space at that time. Um, same thing, e-regulatory, even 10 years ago, they had started, but they were very, very um, rudimentary. I, I wouldn't have grabbed onto one of them yet. So we, some of it is you had to kind of wait for the technology to catch up. Uh, once my e-source vendor, um, they started adding um, different um, solutions. So they started with e-source. Uh, then a few, about, I don't know, I want to say a couple of months, years later, not, not years, a couple months later, they added the finance aspect, which is the CTMS portion. Then they added e-regulatory. Then they added a recruitment section and, and the ability to text and phone call your patients from their system. So they, they became a total solution. And as they added those different programs, we switched. So at this moment, I have everything in one system. Um, but I, I like saying I have that background of having everything piecemealed uh, because, as you know, Ken, I speak to tons of different sites across the country on a, I would say, on a weekly basis because people do know that we are fully electronic and have had this journey. So I do get site, um, site directors, owners, whatnot, calling and saying, okay, what do I need to know? Um, and so I, I give the background of you first have to do what works best for your site. Having worked in multiple doctor's offices through my 20 years in this career, I've never seen one operate the same. Um, same thing, I came out of the academic and medical hospital situation. They're never the same. So you, you first and foremost have to do what works best. And what might work best is to buy the singles, as your metaphor says. If it works that you, you have a good system over here, but you need this, then maybe piecemealing it is a good idea. Um, I went with the total, total solution vendor because Anybody that works at the site level knows we have about a thousand different vendors and, and modules we have to log into at any given time. And I just didn't want that fragmentation at my site. And so my coordinators log into my, my entire staff from invoicing to recruitment to everything in between logs into one exact system every day and they all talk to each other. So my invoicing gal can see what my CRCs are doing. Um, my CRCs can, and those are clinical research coordinators, not to keep using alphabet soup, but um, they can see what my recruitment specialists are doing. And so that was attractive to me at a smaller site level. It was easy for me to make that total solution um, the best solution for our site. But it's, That's you know, highly, really, highly It's really illuminating to me. Agatha has a, a set of apps. Uh, we don't. Uh, they're more on the content process management. So we have a trial master file, an ISF for the remote site. We have an SOP management solution for standard operating procedures. So we have a suite of apps. But for us, there's a, con there's a centricity to a set of apps. And we don't do CTMS because CTMS, from a technologist's view, is a different thing. You're getting into budgets and schedules. It's just a different thing. But I completely hear you because one of my biggest learnings as I've tried to understand sites much better is the technologies we use with CROs and sponsors, basically, if we don't adulterate them, won't, won't hack it at a site. And that's because we're assuming we have most of a user's attention. They're gonna learn the intricacies of our system. Here's how you route something for approval. Here's how you do it. Because you know any system that you use, if you use it a lot, it gets to be second nature. But your staff have lots of different things to do all day. And there's nothing worse than a system that you occasionally go into and have to remember, how do I do that again? My classic example is many of us get paid by big payroll companies. And uh, you go on to your portal. And if you're like me, it's like, how do I change that 401k allocation again? Because you don't do it every day. You do it every six months. So the system's really out of sight need to be better. They need to be easier to use. And as you said, logging in one place makes a lot of sense. We're putting a lot of focus on that. Of, yes, this is how this function would be done by a sponsor user. But in reality, how would a CRC at a site do this? It better be drag and drop in one click or else we'll lose them. They just won't have the attention span. Well, and a point to that is by having for me anyway, by having all the systems talk, and I'm gonna inadvertently answer one of these questions um, because somebody did ask, 
what do we do for logs such as the delegation of authority? Well, our delegation of authority is an electronic delegation of authority log, and it talks both to our regulatory system and our e-source system. And so if that person, if my regulatory specialist says you need to be trained on X, Y, and Z before you're allowed to do that particular procedure, it won't let that CRC go in and do that procedure. Uh, and which mm -hmm. that's a major finding by the regulatory authorities is people conducting procedures that they haven't been delegated or that they haven't done the training for yet. Maybe the, C the PI signed off on that delegation, but if they haven't completed the training, then the study sponsors a not going to be happy, but the regulatory authority is not going to be happy. So one of the benefits of all the systems that I see talking is we can kind of make those connections within our system. So it alleviates what is it, what is a potentially a major finding in a, in a regulatory audit. Sure, that makes great sense. There's a place we're going to get to as an industry because this is the history of every industry with software, where you go from some best of breed apps to a suite or a, a single vendor, but some of the software is bad from the single vendor. This is the history of software where, oh, this vendor has been successful, so they start buying company. And pretty soon, I think of it as they're cramming software and saying, yep, we've got a CTM up, we've got this. So they're cramming things together, but some of it is of not quality. And I would say to everyone listening, don't think because everything's from a single vendor, it actually works well together. That's not true because companies buy software and they're different. So we're going to get somewhere because this is like the, the third step. You start with best of breed, you end up with a, a set of apps, and then you realize we can have the best of both worlds. We don't need a single vendor, but we need all the software to talk very well to each other through industry standards. So we don't care whether the sponsor is using this TMF or that TMF. And the sponsor doesn't care which e-source doc because they can send documents between each other. And that's industry standards between the two that just become a, a Rosetta Stone, if you will. Uh, and you have a ling, I, I can't do French, but a lingua, lingua franca, whatever it is, uh, a common way of, of passing stuff back and forth. So that's, I hope to live long enough to see that because it's not fast to get there. But that, that, I can see your smile saying, yeah, that's it. That's what we need. Um, yeah. which really opens the door to a, a whole lot of topics. I'm highlighting a few last things I want to talk about because uh, I knew this would happen. We could speak for two hours instead of one. Um, we've done that. Let's switch to kind of a broader topic, which I just touched on. Um, in your case, you use eSource. You have all your source documents in one place across two businesses and multiple locations. But you have up to 20 studies going on, and I assume that's across multiple sponsors and CROs. So how does that work? How do they get the source information? Do you have to learn lots of different systems, or are you, uh, is your team uh, become fluent in Viva and Agatha and these other systems to work directly in them, or is there a different solution I'm not aware of? Well, it, the the, the, the correct answer on that is, is it depends, which I, I always hate that. Um, so obviously we have our one software program that our coordinators go into because I can control that. I, you know, I get to buy that software and control it. I cannot control what the study sponsors push down to us, which means um, we do go into different um, ECRF um, modules, whether it's inform, metadata, et cetera. And so my coordinators are all very fluent in many of those systems. We have a number of um, patient reported outcome vendors uh, that the sponsors choose for their studies. These are those e-diaries, tablets, whatnot that patients will actually directly enter their pain scores into or um, how well their health is or, you know, um, just various patient reported outcome uh, questionnaires. And so those, my different coordinators are very conversant in those different systems. Um, and then obviously there's e-regulatory or I guess I should say TMF uh, systems that we can upload our regulatory documents into things like Agatha and Viva Vault and, and whatnot, uh, that we are also very uh, skilled and, you know, we, we know how to get documents into that from it. How they, how they upload and put it in, some have us upload directly into their system. 
Other study sponsors want us to email them uh, the regulatory documents in a zipped file via email. Um, we don't have anybody that asks us to FedEx, but it, that, not too long ago. I mean, I would say within the year, we even had study sponsors that said, fax us your, or I mean, FedEx us your wet ink signatures of financial disclosure forms, um, 1572s, et cetera. So mm -hmm. the broad system that my coordinators have to kind of figure out, and it's why it was so attractive for me to, to kind of keep the stuff at the site as simple and cohesive as possible because we're spread out across many, many different systems as far as what the sponsors give us. It's really remarkable and it, it creates another metaphor in my mind that uh, if you're an auto mechanic and you work at a dealer, then, you know, you deal with the same make and a few models of car and you become very expert and you're very deep on those vehicles. But your team has to be more like the local mechanic who has any kind of vehicle coming in from a 1950 DeSoto to a Lamborghini and say, well, how do we do it with this one? And keep yep. figuring it out. So you have a set of tools, just like that mechanic, a whole set of tools across the wall that says, well, I think we could use this thingamabob to do that thingamabob to get this into that system. You probably know more about translating documents between systems than, than a hardcore IT person. It's really remarkable. And it is intimidating. I'm guessing some people on the phone, excuse me, listening in are a little intimidated. But um, it's a solvable problem, and I'm going to kind of come back to the urgency. It has to be solved. When I mentioned the ecosystem before in my own set of slides, and I mentioned that the sites are under-automated, and that's a, a huge block in efficiency. You would also point out, as you have before, that the other problem is that while the sites are under automated, the vendors, excuse me, the CROs and sponsors are telling you to use different systems and different methodologies. And even though you've already put this into the system, please fax it to me and, and all this redundancy. So it's just not a very efficient model through the, the whole thing. But now it's really important. It's always been important, but with, um, the inability to travel, but the need to continue the science, we need a way to be more connected remotely rather than solving the problem by saying, we'll send two people out to visit for two days and we'll solve it. That's still a need. We've been on panels before with talking about remote quality and monitoring, and that will still happen, but a lot of it can be automated and remote, and that will reduce cost dramatically, increase efficiency. But I, I can yeah. see so clearly now, it's like the sites speak Latin, and the sponsors speak Greek. And I mean that literally because we use different words, but also the systems and how they interconnect. Um, that you've built a wonderful system within your world, and your pain point is connecting to the rest of the world. I think I cut you off, Jim. No, no, I, I was, I was going to actually kind of bring up a point, so I, and I didn't want to cut you off. I, um, you had kind of mentioned the ability for study sponsors to come in and, and monitor and how that's obviously with the current environment not really happening and this is where the benefit of being a fully electronic site has has been realized because as and you also mentioned you know as study sponsors wanting me to fax this there email this there and i don't do that anymore i say nope you know what you can have access to my system you go get it yourself I'm, you're not going to take my time or my study coordinator's time to go get it if you want that document here's your login and password into our system you find it and it's very searchable. They put in protocol amendment one and it pops it right in. Um, that's where being fully electronic has been so beneficial during this uh, current pandemic. Um, our workflow really hasn't changed. We did that before the pandemic. Uh, our system is such that we can give access to whoever needs to have access to just the study that they're allotted to. Um, that's one of the benefits to having a true vendor that is made for e-source versus an electronic medical record because electronic medical records for the most part were not designed to house source documents. They were housed to, to, to hold patients, clinic chart notes, everything. And, and it's really difficult to only give access to one patient or five patients that are in that study. If you give right. access a lot of times, we see access to the whole system uh, with with these various um, programs that we're starting to see, you can give access to the study monitor just for that particular study. And then that study monitor has, it's almost like he or she is sitting at your site 
going through the paper binder. They, they can see right. everything in that binder. And that's been imperative because it really is a time saver for our site to not have to do that work for the study sponsor. We don't, we don't have to get it for them anymore. They have access to it and they have access to it in real time. They also don't right. have to wait on us. They can get it at two in the morning if they want. And so that's where we've started seeing this streamlining. And I do think the pandemic is going to really be a catalyst for that. You must be pretty skilled at this because I was worrying about leaving our audience a little overwhelmed with, you know, this is hard to do, et cetera, but you spun it, not spinning in the bad way, you pivoted to the benefit of it in terms of the things you mentioned about being able to save those wasted resources on resending and re-uploading. And obviously, your businesses are very successful and you've taken a certain strategy. One thing I, I remember you saying to me at some point is big advice, and this isn't from a vendor trying to maximize revenue, but don't skip on the technology. Um, invest in good technology because uh, obviously it's only as good as the system. I wanted to add one thing that came up before that I found interesting, which is speaking about vendors. People may think that I'm speaking only from self-interest or my own perspective, but I really believe this after many, many years. I think you should look at three vendors. I think that's right, you, of course, that makes sense. But what I wanna emphasize to people is don't get hung up on this one takes two keystrokes to do this and this takes one. That is not gonna be what drives success or failure. You need certain functionality, of course, but you know it's like an exercise bike. Sorry for those of you who own Pelotons, but it's not about having the super best exercise bike, it's about getting on it and turning the wheel. So, yes, talk to lots of vendors, but my real point is trying to get there. Go with the vendor that's a true partner, that will invest with you, that will make you successful, that has the support. Don't not choose that vendor because somebody else has one other feature. Don't make it a feature war. Make it a relationship war and choose the vendor who's really going to be side by side. Do call references. Do find out how long it really takes to implement. Um, and Jill's head nods are enough on that one. I wanted to yep. um, wrap up the part with Jill, and then I have uh, a few questions that we'll go through. But I simply want to ask you all the way back to your business and yourself and your family, the whole thing, where's this all leading? So you've built something amazing, and in 10 years, are there going to be 20 of these clinics uh, or, or businesses, and you'll be operating as an SMO, or this is it, this is a nice lifestyle? or at least till the kids are out of the house. I don't know, what's your vision for your business going forward? That's, obviously it kind of changes as the course goes, but I do have two children. I have a 10 year old and a 12 year old, which means in about 10 years, I'm gonna be an empty nester. Um, I'm 42 years old, so I'm gonna give you that one and say, I would love to in 10 years be able to, um, and my, my two daughters would laugh at me right now because they would say, yeah, you are gonna come stalk us. I would love to be able to go see them whenever I want to and whatnot. And the benefit to being fully electronic is I, not during pandemic, but I can take extended vacations and see everything my staff is doing. I can see the revenue. I can, I am fully remote. I'm, I'm sitting in my home office, which is actually where most of the time I do work. And during the pandemic, a lot of my coordinators, unless they're in a physician's office seeing an actual patient, they too can work from home. Um, we can do a lot of charting from home. We can make referral or um, recruitment calls from home. So to kind of go where, you know, in 10 years, where would I love to be? I would love to be in more physician offices doing more clinical research, either here in Boise, Idaho, or again, there's no geographical constraints to it. When you're electronic, you can expand out to more locations, but I'd love to be doing it from a beach, <laughs> quite frankly. <laughs> I have that same dream. Um, as I said at the top, I'm in a hotel room for the bandwidth, but this hotel room could easily be in Belize, where it's mm -hmm. probably about 80 degrees right now. Um, I knew part of that answer before I asked, which is it wasn't going to be, I hope to be retired and done with all this, but I can tell um, you shared that you're 42. At 62, I think you'll still be just gearing up and that you're a lifer, I think. Um, of course, you know, you brought up the best and the worst of the, the automation and remote, which is, on the one hand, you don't have to be anywhere in particular. You can do your job from anywhere. On the other hand, every day you do, still do your job no matter where you are. <laughs> so it does follow you around. 
This has been delightful. Let me um, do two things. Let me advance one slide. Um, can you bring us back to slides, Craig, uh, when, you, when you have a second? It's, uh, that's perfect. Both heads are great. Um, so as I mentioned, Agatha, who's uh, sponsoring this, and I am with Agatha, has a suite of five apps. Our value proposition is we're not like those stinking platforms. Um, so we take a different approach. It's not a large investment of a platform, and then you work through complex configurations and onboarding. These are ready-to-use apps, cloud-based, and we get people on board very fast. Some are more focused to sponsors, like our regulatory submission. But Agatha Remote Monitoring, farthest to the right, is specifically for use at site. And it duplicates some of exactly what Jill was saying, the ability to store binder documents locally, the ability to have a monitor view them and comment on them and provide tasks to the site. So that's Agatha Remote Monitoring. That's all I'll say about that. As far as questions, let me start with the simplest. Um, PB, um, I was told not to use even first names, so PB asked, she'd love or he would love to know your vendors. And I'm going to answer for you, which is to say, I don't think we'll mention the vendors here, but um, are you comfortable if someone sends you an email with that follow-on question, Jill? That would have been how I answered it as well. Feel free to reach out. I'm on LinkedIn. I I can get my email to you, however you'd like. You can sure reach out, and I'll, I'll, I'd be happy to talk more with you about that. Great. Um, JS had a great question. I'm going to both read it but annotate it a little bit. With the increasing burden on site, does that bring a prejudice from CROs and sponsors to be somewhat skewed towards wanting to work with the largest organization, the academic medical centers and hospitals? et cetera, because they are fully automated. They can provide access to EMR, et cetera. I want to make this personal. Do you have a hard time with a prejudice against you as someone running smaller sites? Do you find that? Or do they love you for other reasons that we don't know? I and I don't I don't know the background of JS, but I will have to say I think my impression is while we want those academic medical centers, we, we mainly want them because of their key opinion leaders and because of their name. I mean, they do, you know, when you go to one of those large, well-known academic centers, it lends credence to your, to your, uh, your protocol, mm -hmm. your study, your whatnot. But if you look at most of the data that I've seen, they tend not to be the ones that enroll the most amount of patients. It's small sites like mine that actually are able to enroll most of the patients. And now that depends on the study. If you're looking at an inpatient ICU study, of course you have to go to those hospitals. But if you're looking at outpatient studies, um, it's actually small independent sites like mine that do most of the enrollment across those studies. Uh, so I think to answer that, it's it's very individual depending on the protocol, the study sponsors, what their intentions are. Um, I do think small sites like mine can pivot a lot quicker than those large academic institutions. Um, having been from one myself, there's a lot of red tape and bureaucracy before a decision changes and can and can be modified. Um, there is a lot of firewalls to get access to those EMRs. Uh, there's a lot of I've I've talked with many study monitors where it's about two months before they can have access into those because there's a IT vetting program they have to go through. When I've when they've asked what does it take for me to get access into your system, I say, well, shoot me an email and I'll send you the invite. Um, it, it's literally done under five seconds, and so. It, it really is dependent on what their end goal is. Uh, there's places for independent research sites, and I do not think there's a bias against us. I think most study sponsors use independent research sites quite a bit. And then there's a place and a time for academic institutions where they can provide things that small independent sites like mine can't. And so I, I do think I never have believed in a scarcity epidemic, and so I don't believe that there's not enough research for all of us. I also have to believe that among similar sized independent study sites, your automation, the crispness with which you run your business, has to be very, very attractive to sponsors and CROs. Uh, ultimately, you know, you're in a funny business. Those are your customers, and you want them to come back for the next study and the next study. Um, and being as organized as you are, being as automated as you are, has to be a, a pretty good selling point when you're trying to line up the next one. JS uh, was, seemed like a very bright person because he or she pointed out 
it's important not to have that bias because it could affect actual patient demographics, et cetera. Uh, and that makes a lot of sense to me. The last one I'm going to cover today is from MJ. And um, I, again, he might be asking the vendor, but I'm going to ask the question and see how you answer it. What system do you use for logs? such as the delegation of authority log. So again, we don't have to answer the vendor, but is that an automated system or I don't even know what the question is about. So the delegation of authority log is uh, for the principal investigator, for the physician overseeing it at the site to delegate tasks and that has to be recorded somewhere. Traditionally, and I would say 90% of the time, probably 99% of the time, that's still done on a paper document where we write the name of the, the coordinator, what duty she can perform, and then the investigator has to sign off on that. We have changed that into an electronic log. Now, to answer that question fully, we do have two logs that we keep in paper. Um, and it, we, it's literally in a, in a binder this big for each study. And one is the in investigational product or investigational device log. Um, Studies are tasked with making sure we have accountability for any of the, the medication, the IP that we dispense. So that, because we're in it daily and, and changing it daily, we do not do that electronically. Um, we've just found it easier to stay on paper at the end of the study when that's a final document and everything's, all the IP has been sent back and it's final. We do upload that final version of it into our e-regulatory for archiving. Um, the other log, which is also becoming obsolete since we don't have monitors coming, is when a CRA or a monitor comes on site, they have a, a log they sign that says they were on site. Well, we're not having that much anymore and we're having these remote uh, monitoring visits. Uh, so we're kind of changing that a little bit. It's, it's becoming obsolete. So those are the only logs we keep in paper. The delegation log at our site is electronic. And a point I want to make before we jump off is we, prior to COVID, had a, a little bit of resistance from study sponsors, um, from CROs at some of the technology. Um, it's new and it's different, so therefore it's a little scary. Um, Post-COVID, and well, not post, I wish we were post-COVID, but during COVID, um, you're right, Ken, it's been an incredibly attractive um, scenario. When, when study uh, sponsors find out you can, you can fully remote monitor us with really little to no um, change in how we con conduct our business, it's, it's been a big selling point for new studies um, these last seven, eight months. I bet. It's very impressive. I want to finish with just two quick notes and offers before I say thank you. One is I've been offering a couple of white papers. These are on remote monitoring. They're available on my company's website, site agathahealth.com. One is a technology guide to remote monitoring, looking at the features and functions you want in a remote monitoring solution. The other is the results of a survey in white paper format on remote monitoring. Remote monitoring has been the center of a lot of my mm, research and learning, academic side stuff for the last six months. More importantly, in my opinion, although the white papers are great, um, I want to partner with Jill. So here's really what I think is a remarkable offer. Continue the conversation. So for anyone listening, if you want to talk to Jill and I together for an hour, Talk about your business, your plans, your ideas, your obstacles. We will join you for an hour in what I think of as a discovery call. You'll get the best thinking we can offer from both a vendor side or a technology side and an operational side uh, and a site side. And it can be as formal as you want or as informal. It can be a casual call or it can be quite structured. You tell us, here's my initiative, what do you think, and take us through your plan. Um, this is part of my on, own ongoing work with talking with people who are implementing systems. Um, I, I do some of this work myself for doing readiness assessment and finding the gaps. But it would be so much fun to do it with Jill. We'll do the one hour at no cost. Agatha will cover that cost. Um, and really what you get out of it is an hour of insights from two people who have together too many years of experience. At least I have too many. Um, so if you're interested in that, my email is on the screen. It's very simple, ken.lowney at agathalife.com. Excuse me, I misspoke, agathahealth.com. We have two websites and I confuse them sometimes. agathahealth.com. So drop me a note if you want to continue the conversation. We'll schedule an hour with Jill and I over the next several weeks.
With that, the most important thing I can do is say, wow, thank you, Jill. Um, My you, you're so open with your thinking and your thoughts and so cogent and pithy. Um, one of my favorite words, pithy. You're quite pithy. Um, not like an orange. I um, really appreciate your time. We're right at the top, and I have to say goodbye. So thank you to everyone who joined, and uh, we'll do another one of these someday soon. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. On behalf of the Center Watch and Agatha, I'd like to thank our participants for joining us today. Be sure to fill out the survey at the conclusion of this webinar. Your feedback is very important to us. This now concludes today's webinar. Have a great day and hope you join us again in the future.